Old Dominion's Ricky Ronnie on Locked On Sunbelt. You are Locked On Sunbelt, your daily podcast on the Sunbelt Conference, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, Dave Schultz back with another edition of Locked On Sunbelt, your team every day. Uh, we have Old Dominion's head coach, Ricky Ronnie. First time he's come on the show, so we certainly appreciate his time. We talk about what happened in 2022, new offense in 2023. He likes his depth a lot, a lot more depth here in 2023. Advantages and disadvantages of being in Norfolk. He also talks about what he's learned as being a, a head coach and how he's taken that approach here in 2023. And he appreciates his ability not only to play Power 5 teams, but once again, I mean, they got a gauntlet of a schedule to begin the season, right, at Vatech, which they beat last year. They get uh, the Louisiana Raging Cajuns game two, a conference schedule very early on, and then they're hosting Wake. So he appreciates playing those Power 5 teams. Let's get right to it. He is the head coach of the Old Dominion Monarchs. He is Ricky Ronnie. Welcome back to another edition of Locked On Sunbelt, your team every day. I'm your host, Dave Schultz. Thrilled and honored for the first time, welcoming, welcoming ODU head football coach Ricky Ronnie to the show. Uh, before we get into last year, I do want to back it up a little bit because I'm not sure I knew anything about ODU football before they beat Virginia Tech in 2018. I knew about the basketball only because as a kid they played Syracuse. And I knew about the baseball, right? Justin Verlander may or may not be traded uh, on, uh, on Tuesday. Uh, and he's one of the all-time greats. But a manager that I had, Back in my minor league days, Mark Wassinger, I believe, is in the ODU Hall of Fame. He's got three World Series rings as a, an advanced scout for the for the Red Sox. So I knew more about the basketball. I knew about the football. I knew about the uh, the baseball, but didn't know anything about ODU football. What did you know about ODU football before you got there, and what have you found out since? Well, I was, uh, you know, with those travel camps, that's where that came in. You know, at, at Penn State, we were one of the first people to do some of those travel camps, and and. Uh, Old Dominion was one of the pla first places we went. So I I'd been here a number of different times for that, um, just kind of, you know, coming up and, and doing those sort of camps and, and trying to get something done on that end, um, recruiting and, and things like that. So I'd, I'd been here for that. I'd never really, I'd never visited the area. I know a lot of people visit it for vacation and, and obviously for right. for people on the on the East Coast, it's a, um, a, a and Mid-Atlantic, it's a huge place to go for vacation and that sort of thing. I'd never come, you know, being from Colorado and that sort of thing. So, yeah, it was a little uh, I didn't know as much about it. Um, I found out a ton. I mean, it, it's it's obviously a, a very proud area and with a lot of history. I mean, we have, uh, you know, places where George Washington stayed, you know, during the Revolutionary War. And, and uh, you know, there's cannonballs in, in churches and things like that. So there's all I mean, it, it, it's it's a very proud area from that. Um, I've learned that it's it's everything's really, really close, but sometimes it's incredibly hard to get around because although you can see the place you want to get to, uh, there's water in between, right? So you, right. you've got to go around and take all sorts of bridges and do all sorts of things, but it's a beautiful area. I love living here. I live about a mile away from, uh, from my office where I'm sitting right now. In fact, I walked to work today. Um, so, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a great place and it's a place where, you know, it's a, um, Nice college town, but there's still, you know, 1.7 million people in the total Hampton Roads right. area. So it's a place where we can have internships and, and, and get some real live experiences for our kids. And and also we should be able to, to sell out or get close to a sellout in every single game. So um, there's a lot of advantages built in. Well, now that you mentioned it, I guess my family has a couple of connections. I found out that I was having a baby brother. Uh, my parents told us when we were in Virginia Beach, we did like a Bush Gardens, Williamsburg, Virginia Beach vacation. So I found out that the, you know, I was getting a little baby brother. And then the middle brother actually did his residency in, in Norfolk. He's a doctor in Louisville. So there is some connections uh, there. But I was going to actually ask you that you are by far the largest market in the Sun Belt. Everything, you know, one of the largest markets in college football, for that fact of the matter. Um, you know, everything is a nice sort of college town from Statesboro to Hattiesburg to Lafayette. Uh, but you are, you know, Norfolk's a major metropolitan area. At one point in time, you know, it was the largest area not to have a major league franchise. Uh, and how does that how does that help? And does does it hurt you that it's in a city and not a college setting per se? Um, I think obviously there's a few more distractions and things that we have to deal with that maybe the average uh, person does. Um, I think it 
on the flip side of it, like I talked about the internships and some of the, the things of, as we begin to um, continue to get into this NIL space, I think that, that you know, mm-hmm. that is something where we can have an advantage. We, we've still got to um, develop it a little bit more. Um, one thing that we have is, and I tell people this all the time, and I'm not afraid to bring it up. I, I'm okay with being everybody's second favorite team, right? I mean, everybody around here, they're not, they didn't necessarily go to, go to Old Dominion, but we have a lot of people who buy season tickets. I mean, um, you know, there's people, I mean, one of my really good friends in the area, he's a diehard Ohio State fan, but, you know, he has four season tickets and goes to every game and and, and all those sort of things. You know, that that happens to be for a lot of our a lot of our fans. I mean, shoot, there are a lot of our fans who go to every single game and they, you know, they may be JMU fans, right? So it's like right. they, they, but this is way easier for them to get to. They may be Virginia right. Tech fans. They may be North Carolina fans, um, all those sort of things. But then we're their second favorite team and they support us and, and they're very, very supportive. I mean, they're supportive of our players, supportive of me and our program. So I have no problem with that. And then we have also have an extremely passionate fan base. I mean, we're, we're 19,000 undergraduates. So we have a lot of, we have a lot of graduates too, right? So the, the difference is our graduates tend to disperse a little bit. Um, sure. You know, we get a lot of people from the military that come in and that sort of thing. So um, we've got to make sure that, you know, we continue to engage those people and, and, and get them around. But we're trying to get as many people to the games. Last year, we averaged over 19,000 fans. So um, we're, we're going to continue to try to do that. We have, you know, one of the best stadiums, I think, in the, in the country. Um, when you consider the size and, and what we are, I think it's a perfect size. Uh, it was just rebuilt in, in 2019, so it's it's beautiful, and everyone talks about it, you know. So, you know, we've, we've got a lot of advantages uh, built in. Talking to Ricky Ronnie, the head coach of Old Dominion Football. All right, let's go back to last year. It was uh, ended up being a down year, but you guys got off to a good start, a, a major upset almost, and probably should have beaten Virginia. We won't harp on that, but you did uh, take down Coastal Carolina, and then kind of the bottom fell out. What, what did you see? Uh, that happened uh, to the team that couldn't take advantage of the big win over the, uh, over the Chanticleers. You know, I just, uh, overall, we just weren't consistent enough. I mean, uh, our defense played too many plays, uh, partially was on deep on offense. We didn't sustain enough drives. We were able to create some explosive plays, which allowed us to get the wins over, um, you know, uh, Virginia tech and, and then we were very explosive against Coastal Carolina, but we weren't consistent enough to be able to sustain it. And what that did is created too many plays for our defense. And then our defense didn't get off the field well enough on third down, uh, played extremely well in the red zone and did some things there, but didn't get off the field well enough on third down. So as the year went on, uh, we just played too many plays uh, and, and and that and the depth got us and, and, and that sort of thing. I think that's where we've improved from last year. We have a lot more depth this year. Um, obviously, when you lose three NFL players like we did, and actually we have more guys who are in camps right now than, than just the three who got drafted. But, you know, you, you think about your top end and, and those sort of things. But I think our depth is, is is very much improved, which in this conference, you've got to have great depth. There's just too many great teams week in and week out. So you got to have great depth. I think that, you know, ultimately that was that was the thing that got us last year. I mean, we played a lot of tight games and we were able to right. come up with a, a win over Virginia Tech. Um, but then after that, we really didn't close and win the tight games that we needed to. I mean, you mentioned the Virginia game. I mean, that's a last second field goal that we that we really uh, uh, should have put away. Um, you know, we had we threw a game tying touchdown pass that got called back against South Alabama. I mean, we're, we're, we're right in the game, you know, all the way up into the fourth quarter against Marshall, against Liberty. Um, you know, we against uh, Georgia uh, Southern, we. Unfortunately, we, 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 we miss a couple field goals and those sort of things and lose by five in that game. So, I mean, there's there's we had some close games that we just didn't come, come out on top. I think if we do that. Um, I don't believe in momentum, but I do believe in confidence. And I think our confidence would have been uh, much greater. And now that makes you maybe make that play or makes you believe you're going to make that play and maybe some of those other games. Yeah, I was going to credit the team for that South Alabama uh, ball game. You, you know, South Alabama is looking to go to a major bowl and uh, and get uh, ten wins for the first time in school history. You guys are, you know, supposedly going to mail it in a game after a day after Thanksgiving. You lose Nick Salivari to to food poisoning, and yet, like you said, it ended up being a one score game. I remember at halftime, you know, telling people in the press box, you know, keep screwing around and see what happens. Uh, and you guys just would not go away. Do you still be? Do you still find a little pride in that? I know a loss is a loss, and you know that's what we count. 
But that, that game could have been, you know, heading into it, you know, 35 to 10. And I think it was 27, 20. Yeah. I, I, I thought we played, you know, pretty well in that game. There's still, we, we missed some opportunities very bluntly that um, came back to haunt us. And, and uh, you know, I thought that, uh, you know, just like I think in probably every game, I thought we should have won that game. You know, so right. there's 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 no uh, there's certainly no moral victories or anything like that. I think the guys responded well from losing a guy like Nick, who was one of our leaders, and and not knowing. Right, we knew we weren't going to have Zach Coons. Right, we knew we weren't going to have uh, Ali Jennings. We knew we weren't going to have some uh, uh, Maury Morrison. We knew we weren't going to have a bunch of those guys. Uh, that was you know that had been for weeks and months. Um, but that. You know, that Nick thing the night before the game or really the day of the game, uh, that was a little bit harder to swallow. Um, but it, yeah, I think guys responded well and they and they played hard. And, and uh, you know, I, I, I've told you guys, I wasn't real happy with our effort in the in the JMU game. And I wasn't real happy in the effort of the first half of the of the App State game. I thought the second half of the App State game, you go look at that one. And, and uh, I mean, we beat them pretty good in that second half. We just weren't able to finish it, um, you know. But I thought then we carried that through into the, in the South Alabama game. And, and, and so I thought in general the guys responded well um, the entire season and, and played well. We just, you know, efforts and expectation, right? We've got to perform. Performance sure. is ultimately what we're judged on. And, and we, all, we all know that, that, that that's part of it. So um, we've been really concentrating on that and um, in the offseason. I think we've done some good things there. All right, let's take a timeout. When we come back, Ricky Ronnie will talk about his new offense and his battle at quarterback for the 2023 season. Let me tell you a little bit about LinkedIn Jobs. These days, every new potential hire can feel like a high-stakes wager for your small business. You want to be 100% certain they have access to the best qualified candidates available. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the right people for your team faster and for free. Add your job in the purple hashtag hiring frame to your LinkedIn profile to spread the word that you're hiring. Simple tools like screening questions make it easy to focus on candidates with just the right skills and experience so you can quickly prioritize who you'd like to interview and hire. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. That's linkedin.com slash locked on college to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. All right, Dave Schultz back with more Locked On Sunbelt, your team every day. Let's get back to our interview with Old Dominion head coach Ricky Ronnie talking about his new offense and offensive coordinator for 2023. Talking to Ricky Ronnie, head coach of the ODU Monarchs on an edition of Locked On Sunbelt, your team every day. All right, so let's look ahead, making wholesale changes on the offense, bringing in the former Fordham uh, OC and his backup quarterback, uh, does he have the job? Tell us about the new offensive coordinator and who's going to be calling the signals for you uh, on the field during the game. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, Coach Deck bringing him in and also be bring, uh, able to bring in the offensive line coach as well, Coach Huddle, uh, you know, that was big for us. I think our, our overall attitude and our overall confidence has changed from um, on the offensive side of the ball and really throughout the whole team. I think the defense is confident that our offense is going to go out there, perform, and score points, um, and I think that helps everybody. Um, you know, Coach Deck's done a, an unbelievable job. He, he believes um, in our system. He believes in, in the, uh, you know, the nuances that we can do to change things, the answers that, that we have and that sort of thing. So I'm, I'm really excited about where we're going in the direction. We're headed right there on, on that end of it. You know, from a quarterback's perspective, we're still battling it out. It's, uh, right now it's really a two-horse race between Jack Shields and Grant Wilson. Um, so that'll go through as long as it takes. Right. I mean, I mean, it, it could take, you know, two weeks. It could take three and a half and four. Right. We got to see and somebody's got to grab it. And and really, somebody's got to win that job, not not be win it by default, and not be given to them. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm excited about uh, where we're going in, in that direction. We've got to make sure and see where we're going to be. The other there's a lot of starting jobs up for up for debate. Right. On the offensive line, um, at wide receiver, at tight end, at running back. So, you know, there's a lot of things to go. What I do think we have is a, a lot more depth. So I don't think it's necessarily going to be, you know, last year we kind of leaned on one running back. Two years ago, we kind of leaned on one tight end. You know, last year and the year before, we kind of leaned on one wide receiver. I don't think we're going to do that. I think it's going to be much more by committee and, and the ball will go where the ball's supposed to go. So uh, I am excited about that. It makes us much more difficult to defend that way. Outside of having the starter before camp starts, when do you like to know in your mind – who is the starting quarterback, whether I find out or, you know, the fans find out in your mind, 
when do you like to have that done uh, so you can start to move forward and prepare for the season? Yeah, I, I say probably two weeks out. You know, I mean, you right. like to know two weeks out so that the guy can get a couple of uh, non game week practices before, you know, the game week. The game week for the first week is really about a week and a half, right? You get really sure. two Tuesday practices, two Wednesday practices, two Thursdays, you know, so you get kind of two weeks instead of in, instead of uh, the normal one. So uh, you'd like to know probably two weeks out so that he can get those last couple where he's not thinking about the game week. He's just thinking about going out and executing and that sort of thing. Everyone can feel comfortable, feel good. Um, and kind of and maybe that last scrimmage, it, everyone knows that he's the starter. Um, that's when you'd like to have it. I've done it other ways before as well. Um, right. But that, that, that's what you prefer. Uh, all right. So how long does it take? You're implementing a new offense. You got a lot of new players, as you said. The offensive line is up for grabs. Uh, running backs up for grabs. You got breaking some new wide receivers. How long have you uh, – How long? what's been your experience? How long it takes to you know implement a new offense from uh, thinking about it right to reacting and i presume you can see that night and day from we'll just say what the first game is going to be you know the first game in september to october you would hope there'd be some major progress in that time or in your case with your schedule i don't know who put a put that schedule together coach but good luck the first three ball games you're looking for it to be it's gonna be something on august 1st and it better be much improved by september 2nd yeah i mean it, it, in the past i think it's taken a spring and a camp you know what I mean? To get it going. Yeah, you make some improvements during the year. But I think, again, those improvements come more with the kids confidence necessarily than it does with their execution. You know what I mean? They, they might make a one headed catch because they believe that that play is just unstoppable because they've seen it so many times in practice and that sort of thing. So I think that it's a little bit more on that end. So it, it does it does take that. Um, I think we actually have an advantage because we have so many new players. That, that we're putting and we're putting it in a new offense. There's nobody, you know, if you bring in this many new players, and maybe you have an old offense, half the guys are on 400 level and oh. the other half are on 100 level. Okay. Right now we're all on 100 to 200 level and working through right. it together. I think there's actually right. an advantage to that because the, the reality of it is in college football, particularly in the group of five from now on, you're going to be replacing 30, 35, 40 players every year. And, and so you better – you're basically going to be going back to, to day one install every spring, every camp. And, and so um, that's going to be, I think the biggest challenge for all of us is how do we continue to progress from year to year while knowing that we can't just jump off from 400 and go into graduate level classes when we got some people who are going to be coming in and we're, we're going to need to play. Right. And, and they're not, they're not going to be at the same point. So how do we teach those guys? How do we get them caught up? All those sort of things. I think it's going to be a challenge for all of us, uh, from now until the, the day I hang up the whistle. All right, a few more uh, questions for the head coach of ODU Monarchs, Ricky Ronnie, on a Locked On Sun Belt, your team every day. All right, so in my mind, and I, I could be wrong, you know, we seem to have this, uh, the top spots in each division, right? In the West, it's kind of Troy, South Alabama, the Cajuns, and uh, what I like to call the Fighting Will Halls from Southern Miss. In the East, JMU, App, Marshall, and Coastal. And then it's the next set of groups. How do you get in that? upper echelon group because those are some i mean coach the, the three-time sunbelt player of the year was picked to finish third despite the other two teams not knowing who their quarterback is that tells you how good the eastern division is in the sunbelt how do you get uh the monarchs up to that next level yeah well i would like to say i i don't know if there are tiers i think that's the hardest part of the sunbelt is anybody can beat anybody all the time right i mean right uh, and, and and so I think that that's one of the hardest parts about this thing is is how competitive the conference is. Is you don't every week there's no like all right well at least they've got this wrapped up. The big game is this one. I mean you have you have no idea. And and there's so many and it's all over the place a little bit. You know last year Jamie was finished a pick to finish sixth, and obviously they played very very well last year. But they don't know who their quarterback's going to be. And 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 there's some there's some changes. Like you said, there's a lot of quarterback changes going on. And even you know, at, like you talked about, Coastal, obviously I have a lot of respect for Grayson and what he's been able to do, but now he has a new offense he's got to learn. And and, right. and I had to do that my senior year in college. Um, I assure you that's not easy when you've had success for a number right. of, amount of time and you have to change something. Even with somebody as smart and, and, and brilliant as Coach Beck is, it's going to be an adjustment, right? I mean, it's, it's just different. And so, um, you know, there's you know, even like, you know, there's that third down call in the fourth quarter where it's you're used to maybe this being called or a version of some play being called. And now something else is being called. Right. Um, and in the back of your mind, you have to get through that. So 
there's I think there's a lot of I think this conference is wide open. And, and so I think that's what we have to do is we have to go out there and we have to perform. I mean, ultimately, we have an opportunity and, and, and yeah, our schedule is challenging, but I think it prepares us and, and gets us battle tested for what is easily the group, best group of five conference in the country. Um, and so we're going to have to be ready to go. Now we have we have a conference game in you know, week two, which is a little bit unusual right. for both us and Louisiana. Right. Um, then that's going to be, you know, kind of a I'm glad we're not going to uh, the hottest place in the world uh, uh, in week two. And the um, because unfortunately, I was at Kansas State when we lost uh, to them one time uh, when we played them in like week two, and our guys were like getting IVs left and right. It was wild. Right. But, um, yeah, I, I just think that this conference is wide open, and we just have to we have to be more consistent. And I think that that's really the key is we have to be more consistent. You look at this conference. There's a couple things that happen. You better sack the quarterback, and you better protect the quarterback. Right? If you just look, right. that's been one of the things that is absolutely. W- w- throughout the whole thing is are, are, who is winning the sack battle each and every time, you know, who's winning the turnover battle is obviously uh, going to be another one that, that's, that's critical. And then for me, I think it's the red zone, you know, who's scoring touchdowns in the red zone, who's kicking field goals. I think that it, that right there is going to be the major difference. Yeah. As much as football has changed, it's still about who can protect the quarterback and who can get after the quarterback and the turnover. So it's still pretty basic. It's like, it's, I guess it comes down to, to execution, uh, every now and then. Okay, let's take one more time out when we wrap things up with Ricky Ronnie from ODU. He talks about what he's learned as a head coach and talking about that schedule. He actually appreciates playing Power 5 matchups. We'll do that when we come back. I do want to thank you. The station continues to grow. We need, again, three more subscriptions per day. We can at least do that. Three subscriptions per day to get to the 500 mark before September 1st, uh, as of this recording, we only had two on uh, on Tuesday. So that's a little bit disappointing. So we can do a little bit better uh, maybe today. Uh, if, if you are watching, please let me know uh, what you would like more. I would understand why, you know, some people aren't watching the ODU one, or if it's all Marshall or it's all one school, I would get that. But you would think that the people who are watching it would appreciate it and would subscribe. So I'm asking you to please subscribe to the YouTube channel. It is a big help. Don't forget, you can also get the podcasts wherever you get your audio podcasts, Amazon, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeart. Just search for Lockdown Sunbelt and you should be able to find it. All right, let's get back to it. We wrap things up with the Old Dominion head coach, Ricky Ronnie, what he's learned as a head coach and what's it like playing Power 5 teams, sometimes at home, year in and year out. All right, let's wrap it up here with head coach Ricky Ronnie. Uh, of Old Dominion. We always talk about how the players have gotten better. How have you improved uh, as a head coach? What What do you know now about coaching that maybe you didn't quite uh, quite understand it when you first took the job? Because you've had a, a plenty of uh, assistant coaching experience. I think last year, you know, we had, we had a, you know, in, in training camp, we had a situation where our, our offensive coordinator um, left. And, and so we had to make some on the fly adjustments and I had to coach the quarterbacks. So I think what last year taught me is my ability to be the head coach is important, right? Like my ability to have a relationship with the entire team, not just one section is important. You know, that there's little things that come up where I can solve some issues and and, and take some stuff. We always talk about people taking stuff off the head coach's plate. I've started to look at, at it the other way. My job is to take be able to take things off the assistant coach's plate, right? Like especially during the year, maybe not in the off season where uh, they're, they're it, kind of flips and now it's other things well now i'm doing a lot but they're doing a lot more and i'm trying to help them how do i make their jobs easier so that they can bring the best out of our players so they can bring the best out of themselves during the year so i think that's the number one thing that i've seen is that's really my job is to help you know um help the assistants you know bring the best out of our players help the players bring the best out of themselves and 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 that my impact on a day-to-day basis, where I'm at at every practice, being able to be involved and and coach, you know, really coach a majority of our players, you know, on footwork and technique and things like that is helpful. And 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 it helps the coaches and, and it helps the players. So I think that's the number one thing I've learned. All right, I do have to ask you one more question about the schedule because you do start out at Vatech, you get the Cajuns at home and then Wake Forest. That's a, that's a couple of power five teams coming to – coming to Norfolk how, how does that happen because I know Cajuns fans are desperate for a power five team to come in and they just can't get one for whatever the case may be well I, I talked on that um you know at media day and I and I, and I would I talked on it other times 
you know, this spring it came up about, hey, should we be playing um, spring games against Power 5 opponents right. and all that sort right. of stuff? And I'm adamantly against that. And the main reason why is because I'm blessed to be in a state where the, those guys play me, right? Our, our fans and the people around here put enough pressure on uh, Virginia Tech, on Virginia to play us, right? So why would I want, want to give them the out of letting it happen during a spring game where it, it is what it is? And let, let's let's play on the, let's play when it really really matters and all those sort of things. So I I'm, I, I know I'm blessed. I know everyone always looks at this as a negative. Um, I kind of see a, one of our models this year is, you know, full benefit. Um, and we really get the full benefit of playing this schedule. Uh, yeah, there's some negatives that other people see. But I, hey, I get the opportunity to play against some power five schools that, hey, maybe that helps us in recruiting. You know what I mean? Like, maybe we can get one extra kid that'll help us win. You know, maybe that helps us, you know, sell tickets. Maybe it, it does a number of different things. Maybe it helps us prepare for the Sun Belt season. And the reality of it is, is our kids want to play against the best. They want to play and compete against the best people. So I think it also helps our training camp when they know, hey, we're not opening against, you know, whatever. We're opening with, you know, at yes. a great place, 85,000, you know, Sandman playing, everyone's jacked up. You better be ready to go. You know what I'm saying? And so – um, I, I think that that's something that helps each and every practice. And I thought it helped our summer conditioning and all those sort of things. So there's a lot of benefits to playing the schedule we do. You know, hey, listen, I'm just like I, I, I one of my earliest experiences was at Kansas State. Right. And Coach Snyder built an entire program by scheduling the right way. You know, I just saw a stat that uh, that, that uh, uh, P.J. Fleck at Minnesota. Right. It has he's like exactly 500 in the conference at big 10 and everyone talks about how great a job he has, has done at Minnesota. And he has, he's done an unbelievable job, but what he has done is he's, I think he's 18 and one outside the conference. Right. So <laughs> if you go back and you look at Minnesota before PJ Fleck got there, they were about a 500 team in conference, right? But no one really talked about them. Now everyone talks about them all the time and they're 500 team in conference, but they are 18 and one out of conference. So I understand right. that part of it too, but you know, I just think for, for us and our program, uh, this schedule, there's a lot of benefits to it as well. Ironically or coincidentally, I always get those confused. The Cajuns are heading to take on P.J. Fleck and uh, and the Gophers later this year. He is uh, Ricky Ronnie. He's the head coach of the Old Dominion Monarchs on Locked On Sunbelt. Really appreciate your time, Coach. Hopefully we'll be able to catch up sometime during the season. And good luck in that gauntlet against Vatek, Louisiana, and, and Wake. Because that is, that is not going to be easy. Uh, and I, I think the Wake game is going to be – I mean, Louisiana and Wake coming in in September is going to have that place rocking. So best of luck, and thanks for hopping on Locked on Sunbelt. Absolutely. Thanks for having me on anytime.